Hi, welcome to Bowties and Business. I'm your host, Tim Kubiak. Today we're talking to Harry Brailsford, who's a friend of mine. Harry's been a longtime entrepreneur and he served customers and mentored others for a couple of decades now. He has an MBA in project management from the University of Denver, countless technical certifications, and has 20 years of small and medium business experience. He is at the risk of using a cliche term, a bit of a serial entrepreneur. And right now, a lot of people have to reinvent themselves. So we're gonna talk about his new book, Pocket MBA. You can find it at pocket.mba. And with that, I'd like to welcome my friend Harry to the show. Everybody again, I'd like to welcome my friend Harry to the show. We're gonna talk about a lot of things. He's a well-regarded, well-published author. And in his new book, the Pocket MBA, which we're going to focus a lot of today's conversation on, is about helping entrepreneurs find their place, whether they're starting early in their career or they're making that 50s plus transition. So, Harry, thanks for being here. Oh, a pleasure. And uh, isn't it fun that, that we met in a different walk of life and, and became friends and here I am on bow ties. <laughs> you know, last time I saw you in person, I was in a purple bow tie and we were sitting in Orlando. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Boy, the world sure has changed since who, who would have thunk it? <laughs> it has, right? Yeah. And, and there's a lot of bad things going on, but to the point of your book, there's a lot of people that are establishing great careers right now. So yeah. do you mind sharing a little bit of your own story so people can get to know you? Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's let's roll back. Um, grew up in Alaska. Uh, my, my, my dad was a, a lawyer with Prudhoe Bay in the pipeline. So and we're all from Texas, both sides out of Austin. Off to Alaska we go. Grew up as a kid because of the Prudhoe Bay era. And that's significant because... Uh, I worked on the pipeline during college as a security guard and put away enough uh, uh, money to buy one of the early Apple II Plus computers. So this would have been 1981 when it was uppercase 40 characters, right? And and uh, I found my passion. I mean, me and computers, just, you know, hand in glove. Um, and, and that has been my career ever since. And so off to Seattle I go 30 some odd years ago, got an early Microsoft as a friend of the family for small business server. Okay. I, I, I mean, everybody always comments on this. This is about 1992, 93 was NT Advanced Server to give you a little <laughs> reference, but uh, my, my career took off with small business server and I wrote a bunch of books on it that are behind me. And it was my vertical and in, in, in my niche. And it had the enthusiasm of the Macintosh community, right? It was a really tight community and a lot of fun. Uh, and that was all fine and good. Built this community called SMB Nation, peaked at about 60,000 members with a monthly magazine and four major conferences. All fun and good until about 2014, uh, because Microsoft in 2012 had announced end of life for small business server. And then it cycled out over a couple of years. And uh, Tim, I, 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 I got my hat handed to me. I underestimated, and you have a product background. I underestimated how a community can kind of pause <laughs> when the underlying product goes away. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I learned my lesson and, and we'll get to why this book exists. It, Everything helps everything in the storytelling. So I had to recreate myself, right, in my community. So I did a couple of years uh, in the afternoons, basically, at an analytics startup in Seattle by the Space Needle, got retrained. In fact, Tim, I got paid to get retrained. It was gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best deal ever. Yeah, yeah. It's like going to grad school in data science and uh, and not having to pay. So did that for a couple of years, vested and exited, and then um, pursued a, a, another opportunity that is uh, rapidly accelerating. It's not the focus of today, but um, the last three years, I put a fair amount of time in the afternoons in the Canna Tech area. And, and as you know, I mean, that's not for everybody, but that is a healthy sector of the economy um, with some very unique security requirements, compliance, traceability. It's very serious. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so at the beginning of the pandemic, I uh, uh, had, you know, arguably a little more time on my hands than I hoped for. And I took one of my prior books that in 2003, I wrote a book 
on how to be an SMB consultant or how to be a small business server consultant based on the professional services model, Finder, Minder, Grinder. And Tim, I uh, used some of the early days of the pandemic to downsize from three mini storages down to one and this, that, and the other. And I found the CD-ROM that had those text files, the Word files. So I was like, thank goodness. So I don't have to type, you know, anew. And I turned that into uh, the Pocket MBA Instant Entrepreneur book, 90 Days to, to, to Cash. And uh, I, I'll end on, um, I, I feel I'm living that, right? So I'm living and breathing the reinvention story. So hopefully I'm qualified to tell the story. <laughs> I know for a fact you are, just for the record. <laughs> so, you know, the, 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 the idea being uh, a couple other data points on why this book is here and why I did it was in consulting with another author in the industry, um, he did sort of a cartoony book, uh, much shorter downloadable on, on, you know, becoming an entrepreneur or starting a business. And, you know, there's, everybody should, not only have a book, but should read multiple books. But his whole idea back in uh, March, April was, uh, you know, he's going to kick out this cartoon book because when the payroll protection program funds start to become exhausted in um, July and August, uh, there's going to be a whole lot of hurting going on for certain out there. And people are going to have to reinvent themselves and you better start now. And so I, I drafted behind them, and this book came out in uh, early September. So that, that was another reason to write this book, was to help people. Because, you know, Tim, bottom line is uh, we got to innovate our way out of this one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so for everybody listening, and I know I I'm, I'm, have mentioned it in the opening, but it's pocket.mba is the first place you can find the book, start to get your arms around it. We're going to talk a lot more about that. You talk about innovating your way out of this one. And one of the things you call on really heavily in the opening of the book is in statistics, if you do some expanded reading, tell the story globally right now, right? 50 plus, there aren't jobs. You've got to yeah. create your own world. And, you know, my story is, is I left the corporate world back in January of this year and plan to go do my own thing for many of the reasons you listed in the book. The thing I'll tell you is, is, you sent me the book as I was getting involved in an AI ML company as well, in addition to the things I'd planned to do. So it's that multiple revenue streams, multiple things and reinventing yourself. But I used, and the beauty of this is, if folks get nothing else from this, is when they read this book and they go through it, you literally say, okay, stop and do this. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Open a PowerPoint, do X. Create a parking lot, do Y. Can you talk about, the logic behind that prescriptive nature in your book? Yeah, what, what I wanted to do is provide guidance. Now, uh, not, 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 again, let me emphasize one point that there are um, a lot of books on the market about you know being an entrepreneur. There's a lot of uh, shows and so on. And my feeling is you, you should read them all and, and listen to many of the podcasts. So because you need perspective, right? When you're an aerospace engineer in college, um, a student, it's not like you had one textbook, okay? You, you, you probably had 20 textbooks from different authors with different perspectives and you get into liberal arts and it's probably even worse. And so I just I just wanna be on the playing field. I, 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 I wanna be one of the books that you read. And so what I did was um, thinking of, uh, you know, who could the readers be? And I wanted to have very prescriptive guidance. You might recall Brailsford's Rules of 12. And you follow these rules. Um, and, and that, by the way, that's how you get awarded a PhD in the academic community. You got to kind of make something up. <laughs> so it's Rules of 12. And for example, uh, a, a fiscal quarter is just over 12 weeks, but close enough. So I'm suggesting that you give uh, out 12 cards in a fiscal quarter and collect 12 cards and it builds momentum. That and, and Tim, that's a realistic action. That's a realistic verb. I'm not suggesting 100 calls a day. That's quite frankly not sustainable <laughs> for most nope. of us. <laughs> nope. And you're but, certainly not talking to anybody. 
Yeah. Yeah. So slowly just build up that momentum. And by the end of the year, what are we talking? 50 business cards, roughly, mm -hmm. right? You, right. You, you get to the end of the year and you built your base and that's going to let you do a lot more. Now, maybe what I need to do is weave in the idea of the personas for this book, right? So we talked about the over 50 uh, crowd, over yeah. 50 and fired in corporate America. And there, there, uh, I, again, I, and I believe there are no jobs. <laughs> Let, let's just make a basic assumption that there are no jobs for those individuals. So they have to create their future. Um, mm -hmm. the, the other one would be uh, students. Uh, you know, one of the popular curriculums is uh, the Center for Entrepreneurship at different colleges, right? At University of Texas, University of Alaska. Um, so ideally this book would be on the shelf uh, in the academic community, and I kind of wrote it that way um, for 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 it to be a textbook. Uh, another persona is going to be the laid off worker at Boeing in Everett, Washington. Okay, as an example, and you have a technician, and Boeing has accelerated those layoffs. Tim, initially it was fifteen thousand. It's now up over 25,000 because of uh, how the aerospace industry has been hit, plus the 737 problems. And so conversation I'm going to have probably after the first of the year is go to the Boeing HR department and say, hey, can I sell you a thousand copies of this book as part of the outplacement package, right? You get the resume writing service, you get the, the, the book, you get this and that. So we're really talking about four or five personas. And, and, and the fifth one would be just anybody. In, anybody can benefit from this book. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, the catch-all. Yep. So, I mean, I hope that answers your question, but, but back to your main point. Yeah, I, in, in my writings, um, let's, let's just pick one. I, I, I'll show you, I'll, I'll take another stab at it. So where I'm coming from, it's like, this was a book back in the certification era, yesteryear. You became an MCSE. It was kind of a, a thing. Yep. And this was basically an exam cram book. And so you had lab exercises, right? These were very active books. And hopefully you saw that in this book, that I have steps for you to take, if that makes sense. You do. You do. And one of the other things, since you talked about the personas is you talked about what a person who might not be a successful entrepreneur values in their work. Do you mind talking through that for just a second? See, are you referring to where I, I have a section on who should not be an yep. entrepreneur? You, <laughs> okay. You, you got it, right? Yeah. 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 Well, that's, that's my oldest son, Jeff, uh, who is an aerospace engineer in the Mojave Desert at an undisclosed location. <laughs> <laughs> and he um, has always, uh, you know, he, he was the kid at four years old who was lining up the Lego cars in a straight line, right? He's, he's that guy. And he is an employee and, and happily so. And quite frankly, makes more than me uh, in terms of what I report to the tax man is W-2 wages. Um, every entrepreneur likes to minimize W-2 wages, wink, wink. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> and we like to take dividends and draws. So he literally uh, makes more than me and is doing great. And he's locked and loaded. Okay. So he's a, a DOD guy and he is not an entrepreneur. And that's just his, you know, myopic view um, the other one would be, uh, you know, maybe my sister's husband, a career medical doctor in Seattle, you know, just wicked smart um, in his specialty, in his field, but probably not the right guy to go open up a food cart or uh, a boat tourism company, right? That, that just would not be a natural act. And, and I hope what I accomplished in that section was I give you permission not to be an entrepreneur. It's not bad. It's not bad not to be an entrepreneur. You know, it's it's just, it's Tim, it's not for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, right. It, and one of the things you talk about is entrepreneurs have to realize whether it's two weeks in or two years in, how much time you actually have to spend selling and creating and building those contacts. And if you don't have the fortitude to do that, and I'm a career sales guy, right? So I'm yeah. like, yeah, okay, I got to talk to people. No big deal. Um, <laughs> The other thing, though, that I like that you called on is a lot of it is actually about the interaction. Money is certainly a motivator, 
but it's doing things that are interesting, having that diversity and routine, getting, you know, frankly, this kind of thing. I do the podcast because I love talking to people. The fact I'm getting to talk to an old friend is a double bonus, right? But I love yeah. talking to different people who are starting different companies. So for yeah. me, that works, you know, but for a lot of people, to your point in the book, you know, if you want to go to the office, have a day, log off your computer and walk away, entrepreneurship's probably not the path for you. Correct. Correct. Right. Yeah. Yeah. A friend of a friend's mom in uh, uh, Central Texas. So she's a career uh, and, and, and God bless her, works harder than I do. Um, I, I don't know her super well, but she works at Chase Bank in a call center, right? I mean, that's real work. I mean, these calls are coming in and in and in and in and in. And she's not an entrepreneur, right? She likes the structure of her job. In fact, she was saying the other day that uh, she doesn't like work from home, right? She likes to go into the cubicle at Chase. Uh, her, her social life is the co-worker. She misses that. But she has a lot of rigidity, and that's not a bad word. That's what she does. And to your point, with work from home, when she's off duty at 4 p.m. Central, the, the computer goes off, right? You know, versus the yous and me's, man, I'm, I'm, I'm always writing little stickies on a Saturday morning, right? New ideas and something kind of creeps into the wetware and I write it down on the sticky. And um, a lot of times it goes into the file of uh, unused ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I have a few shelves of those. I get it. <laughs> but, but yeah, you know, back to your point about just the interaction and personality. Um, I, I, I want to give a shout out. I, I think it's Jermaine. Matt Curry, uh, I, I don't know Matt especially well. We've traded notes. He's an author, keynote guy. He wrote a book um, that's pretty popular called The ADHD Entrepreneur. And he says, having ADHD is your secret weapon as an entrepreneur, right? So ADHD is like, choo, 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 you know, versus, uh, and, and I mean this respectfully, but, you know, a, a musician who maybe is on the autistic spectrum, like the Asperger syndrome, right? Again, respectfully, yep. brilliant, brilliant musician. Uh, it's actually a, a distant family member, um, not an entrepreneur, right? I mean, just so laser focused on the music and, and I love listening to him. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. It's funny, I, I, I have a bit of a musical background from my youth, and the contrast I actually always use is my sister versus me. My sister yeah. was the one who could sight read everything, was very focused on this is the symphonic piece. I was like, huh, Black Sabbath put out a new album. Let's learn it by lunchtime, play the songs twice and move on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So talk about you have in the entrepreneurship and the messaging in this book is largely a consultative approach to building your business. Yep. Why do you yep. why do you suggest that? Why do you go down that path? Well, you know, well, first of all, my career, uh, amongst other things, has basically been to be a service provider or or a consultant, right? And that's right. very common in tech. I'm I'm not a developer. I'm not a coder. Um, and and so I literally was an IT consultant for for many years. And again rewind a little bit, love the variety. I always called it dog years. Um, one year of consulting was about five or eight years, whatever the dog ratio is, of working in a, a, a W-2 day job, right? Because a consultant yeah. sees like a dozen different clients and scenarios. It's really cool. So um, that I liked. And so it was a natural act to say, hey, Essentially, take an inventory, you know, Tim, with your, your background in the, the security space and sales, take, a, take an inventory, have a look in the mirror. And what domain expertise do you have? So everybody has some domain expertise. Even the lady in Central Texas at Chase Bank, well, she's going to be able to tell you how call center software works <laughs> or how it doesn't, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Especially from work from home. <laughs> yep. So the easiest thing you can do until you create the next great thing, like a, a toe clipper that has a little bucket to catch the shavings, you know, there's always the inventor mentality, hit or miss. But the easiest thing you can do is capitalize on your domain expertise. And, um, you, you know, as I was writing the book and, and doing some research, because I, 
I, you know, I'm committed to having a, a certain amount of intellectual honesty and transparency and research in my book. <laughs> mm -hmm. I found uh, two gentlemen uh, around my age, you know, present company um, accepted, and uh, they are in Australia, and they have a site, the Over 50s Consultant, okay, and I want to mark, and uh, I think it's Jason, Over 50s Consultant, shout out, um, and they have a system you sign up for, and that's their whole premise, and, and I caught what they were throwing. I already believed it, but they articulated it better that if you're over 50 and you had a career, you know, Tim, let's, uh, oh, I don't, you know, um, event management for technology companies, right? And yep. if you had that career, you have expertise, right? And you could probably do event management and other far away fields. It's, it's sort of the mechanics, the workflow of it. So they do a really good job of talking about that, but, you know, is my young son says, dad, you talk too much. So I hope I've answered your question, but that's why you did in fact read start as a consultant be, because that you, okay. And, and then, you know, we'll, we'll create the next widget or, you know, the, here, the little, you know, the, the, the little cheer symbol thing that you can shout at the TV since you can't go to live football games. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I want to go a little further on that, just because I know your background and my background, right? And in a lot of ways, if I'm a traditional reseller, and I know you've worked a lot with people transforming them into service providers outside of this current project, right? Right. These are guys and girls that have been flipping hardware and licenses for 5, 10, 15, 20, maybe even 30 years at this point, right? Yeah. And yeah. the word consultant strikes them differently than it strikes a lot of people because they're looking at it as somebody that I flipped tin, as my friend Simon would say, right? They were consulting all along the way, but they maybe didn't recognize it as such. Is there, you know, suggestions or advice you have just from personal experience that if you're one of those people I've sold PC, I love the PC server stat. It's my stat of the summer, right? They were supposed to decline 8% this year. They've declined 2%. It's a win. And I'm watching all of my clients that are in that space go, oh, I'm going to grow that next year. Mm, guys, you're not, right? How do you, how do you have that conversation of you need to transform who you are and look at what you've done, maybe through that broader lens? Yeah, you know, it, it goes to the title of the book. Let's try. Great questions, by the way. You're getting me thinking. So, uh, Pocket MBA, okay? And and we actually made a run at this uh, in the 2010 timeframe. We had a fall conference called that. We had a, you got a bike bag. We had a 16-week on curriculum, um, and we were too early for my audience, the geeks, we were too early. And, and again, to be fully transparent, the gentleman and a wonderful, wonderful gentleman, uh, passed way before his time from leukemia. And we, we kind of lost momentum, you know, very sad. So we put it back on the shelf. I, I own the trademark in the pandemic, went and got the <laughs> trademark back, put it on the wall <laughs> and, but pocket MBA. So here's the deal. Um, a traditional MBA would not make sense for the individual you described, right? A, a, a fixer flipper, whatever that term was for selling units. If MBAs are a two-year commitment. You can find yourself six figures in debt, that kind of thing. Yep. And so what we did 10 years ago, and I, I, I weave it into the fabric of the book, but probably not strong enough, is we treated it like a Rosetta Stone language that you could become fluent business in 16 weeks. Okay, so that was our paradigm to get the geeks to speak business speak. And back then, Tim, we had a overused term that probably will make you cringe, but it was to become the trusted business advisor or TBA. Yep. Right. <laughs> it, that, it, it was an era. And, but it really speaks towards uh, learn the language of business and, and you know, think in terms of a little bit higher level thinking, pocket MBA, right? Like I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to think more strategically and so on. And what I'm trying to get you to do is in that case, 
with with the persona you mentioned is be invited to what they call the kitchen cabinet, right? So the kitchen cabinet of a small business is going to have the CPA, the lawyer, and now I want it to be the technology consultant in this scenario, right? Where they can sit in on those quarterly meetings and, and advise the company about the business purpose of technology, not, not just sell another 10 units. So that was that that's that's my answer. <laughs> and, and that that's that's exactly right. And and one of the things you talk about here though is looking at your marketing plan, right? And it, and it falls into your, sort of your sales tips and you use a drone as an example. So if you're an entrepreneur, right, you certainly can work your network first. You can build your contacts. You can follow everything. But ultimately, you have to reach beyond that. Yeah. If you're doing it yeah. for the first time, how do you start to, and you have guidance in the book, I know, right? But how do you start to find that confidence to ask those questions? Ask those questions. Ask and, and, and give me an example of what question I might be asking because I, I went off on drone. <laughs> I'm flying my drone. A, that, hey, hey, you're the one that wrote drone, buddy. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> geeks are geeks. Um, so you talk about, to use another a modern vernacular, people say, find your tribe, right? And it's a lot of times the social media guy. So is your tribe, mine's on LinkedIn, by the way. I do the other stuff, yeah, but yeah, right. My, my, the people I do business with, they're on LinkedIn. Um, if you're an entrepreneur and you're in that space, right? How do you find, if you're looking at reaching out beyond whether it's your current LinkedIn network or maybe your fitness model and an influencer, I will never be that, um, right? How do you find the right place to go start to build those contacts? The traditional way in the book, you use list brokers as an example, right? Yeah. If it's your yeah, first real, time, what, 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 what should you be asking yourself? Yeah, the real secret is, and, and I've done this, and that's what uh, uh, accelerated me in both the analytics startup and the Canatech uh, field, was uh, go to the meetup. So meetup.com is this hidden jewel where um, it's actually a really powerful uh, community and it, it's a search engine. So let's say that, in, in fact, maybe you're trying to uh, engage in commercializing uh, drone usage, right? So re real estate videos of houses, that kind of thing. Maybe that's your passion. You're really into it. I, ca I can assure you in your city or your SMSA, there is a meetup on the commercial use of drones. <laughs> <laughs> And right now the meetups are highly encouraging online, you know, Zoom uh, interaction. But but when we're allowed to have events again, um, that's one of the secrets to my success is you go to the meetups. Uh, you know, I go to this meetup on a Thursday night once a month in uh, North Seattle and there'd be 70 people. And uh, again, it was in the Canatech uh, vertical. Um, but you had, you know, CPAs and, and you had attorneys and you had credit union representatives that are allowed to play in that reindeer game. You, you know, it's this whole ecosystem uh, comparable to oil field services, right? That's a right. big industry. You had security, physical and, and, and cyber and all that. So that is uh, the, the secret to this book. If, if you take anything away from this book, you know, maybe you take five things away from a book, but one would be sign up at meetup.com, find your tribe, and, and maybe expand a little bit beyond just you know, your passion project, right? Try some other meetups. But what a what an underrated, powerful engine meetup.com is. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> So that, do you know how have they transitioned in the COVID world? I have to ask the question. Is it, has Meetup become largely virtually driven at this point? Oh yeah, yeah. And, and, and we run a, a Meetup group up here in Seattle. So it is a, it is a virtual experience, right? It's not, it's no longer at the, 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 the one I was in was this thing called the Sea Monster Lounge. Um, it's fun on a Thursday night, you know, it's fun. They'd have a qualified speaker and all that. So we've gone virtual and, and Tim, un, un, unfortunately it's, it's not the same, right? No. And, and we're hearing that across the board with three day conferences and people are complaining about Zoom keister, you know, they're getting sore on the backside from sitting. 
So, so you, you got to play the hand you're dealt, right? And, you and, and, and we will get on top of this ultimately. So start now. <laughs> I mean, start this motion now. <laughs> yeah. so, so it's interesting. In the last week, maybe 10 days, I've started to have clients and old friends and people, you know, call and say, hey, is anyone doing a live sales kickoff this year? Right? Not that and I know of. <laughs> not that I know of either. But people are asking the question, which tells you mm, they're itching, right? They're, they are tired of whether it's Zoom or whoever's technology. Yeah. And they're, they're looking to get back out there and see people. And I've had the, I've had the debate with some friends that are in the software space. They're like, nope, nobody will ever go back to traveling and it'll never be the business it was. I'm like, mm, guys, I eh, may no, not well. be tomorrow, but I think in a lot of ways, the world will always be different because of this. But in a lot of ways, we will go back and you and I across the table is way more powerful than you and I across the Zoom, period. Well, that and, and again, if we kind of rewind a few minutes ago about relationship building, um, I have, uh, and you've met the wonderful Jennifer Hallmark at my core company, SMB Nation, yep. you know, started as an event manager and, uh, you know, can herd cats and this, that, and the other. Um, she, her, her passion is events and she reads the magazine and monitors the industry. And her feeling is, is we're going to have sort of a neoclassical renaissance of events because we've now, and, and they'll come back stronger than ever. And the reason is, is we now realize, yeah, you know, I can sit here tomorrow, a major distributor you and I both know starting a three-day conference and they're claiming uh, 20,000 attendees. I'm, I'm sure they had 20,000 signups. But but Tim, it's a webinar. I mean, you're looking at a PowerPoint deck, okay? Yeah. And we've quickly realized that's not why I fly to Denver to go to a three-day. It's not, it's not the deck, okay? It's nope. the people. It's the relationships. And we had to learn the lesson the hard way, but yeah, I, I, I love it. I, now, now Tim, that said, um, when you and I worked together, I was pushing over 50% travel and, and it does, you kind of get caught up in it. You know, you just, oh man, this week's uh, Miami for a security company and next week's Denver for the big distributor. You kind of get sucked into it. I do believe I'll modify my behavior to be more selective. I don't know that I want to go back to 50% travel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I do see the value of live events. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting you say that because I look at as my business is growing and evolving, I'm looking at it as almost personally running it as two regional hubs, right? And I live in, I'm live in the Midwest now and my, my children are grown, um, and I'm at the point in the world where I can live between two cities. So I'm looking going, well, if I went here, I could cover these two places in the East and be back in my own bed. And if I went here, I could cover, you know, most of the West Coast in a day and still get back or no more than one night. So I've looked at things like that in the longer term because I know I'm still going to have to see people. And the other thing is, is you and I both know the conferences are going to go back to where they were. It's going to be San Fran, Vegas, Orlando you know, and, and throw in a smattering of other places from time to time. Well, I'll, I'll raise you and see you too on that one, because what I'm trying to do, and again, this, this ties into entrepreneurial thinking, um, a point that I haven't made is uh, I, I can make it all back in about 18 to 24 months as an entrepreneur. And, and uh, you know, I'm, hey, I'm, I'm like everybody, you know, my company peaked in 14, I've had better days. Now, the good news is I'm still here, <laughs> right? Right. I'm still right. here. And that is part of the entrepreneur journey. Um, but, you know, the kids went to college, a little of this, a little of that. So, you know, I need to go uh, hit again, you know, to my satisfaction. Now, when I do, and I, I, I'm confident about that, and I'm, I'm trying to convey that confidence in the book and my interactions with budding entrepreneurs, um, Tim, my, my goal is snowbird, summer birds. So 30 years in the rain in Seattle in the winter and monsoon season, um, I'm, I'm done with that. Now, Seattle's been very good to me and our summers are absolutely gorgeous. So I'm trying to stitch together. I'm trying to be motivated to go get, you know, hit the next big thing to have a uh, winter home in Austin, Texas in the Texas Hill Country because I ride bikes and then, you know, either have a summer rental or a summer home in Seattle 
and arbitrage the weather patterns, you know, like a Canadian goose. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best answer ever. <laughs> yeah. And, but, you know, Tim, I'm not trying to be braggadocious. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to inspire the listeners that uh, set a hairy, a hairy goal. <laughs> set a hairy goal. <laughs> yeah. Set a hairy goal and, and reach, you know, reach out there. And for some of my friends who are entrepreneurs, it's the new Tesla. You know, they're car people. They want the new car. Each to their own. But set, set a goal, right? Yep. Yep. <laughs> new carbon frame bike on your list <laughs> yeah actually you know no you know what and what? and and this is where we're seeing a lot of innovation and i think there's entrepreneurial activity what is on my list because every time i do a deal i i buy myself a toy the the last one was like the ninja foodie okay nice um, <laughs> so i always get a toy when 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 i hit on something um but what i'm going to do is get one of these probably be you know, three, $4,000 electric bikes. Um, I already have traditional bikes, uh -huh. a different stripe. Electric bikes are amazing. They're realistic. You know, in the afternoon, you can realistically not drive and go to the, the market, right? They're, they're realistic. There is a place for an electric bike. And I'm, so it shouldn't be your only bike because you should also strive for cardiovascular <laughs> right. exercise. But, but Tim, that whole area has just started, right? Electric vehicles, electric bikes, and this, that, and the other. Fantastic entrepreneurial opportunities are going to come out of that. <laughs> I, I, I actually, you, I'm laughing as you tell the story. I had a friend that came up through the cyber world, kind of got to the point where, and he had moved to the Valley, right? near we're San Fran proper, actually, right? And kind of just said, I had enough. And literally went into the the power assist bike business. He had ridden one to work to downtown for five years, lost 50 pounds, was as healthy as he was when he was 20. And that's, he said, I'm going to fix and sell these things. Yeah. <laughs> that's Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it, 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 let's, let's go down that rabbit hole. My son, the aerospace engineer, who again is in DOD in the Mojave desert, but one of his interviews um, was with a uh, track out of the Bay area. I think his, uh, Morgan Hill or Concord, somewhere in the Bay Area, they have a big office, and they were hiring aerospace engineers for exactly that, to have a fresh perspective on electric bikes and that kind of thing, and the aerodynamics, you know, I mean, there's a lot of engineering that's there going is. on, Yeah, and, and th that's so cool. Um, now, my son, you know, probably of wiser mind, not, not, not sure he wanted to be a bike builder with the, the debt load he's carrying. And uh, he, he made the right decision to go to DOD. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I own a couple of truck bikes, though. I, I will say, the, if you haven't bought a bike recently, you don't know the difference between your old frame oh, and I your know. new frame and, and the gearing and everything. It's <laughs> even in the, the low end and entry point it is just light years different. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm speaking for myself, what was the Schwinn Varsity in my childhood? You know, the 40 pound steel yep. bike. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, we've come a long way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just I got a 24 year old mongoose because I had busted a lower bracket on one of my bikes and said, oh, I could ride this for a couple of weeks instead of putting something else out in the. Yeah, it was more cardio, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. <laughs> Cool. So you do a whole bunch of other things. Do you mind sharing with the audience, you know, what they are, where they can find you, all that sort of thing? Yeah. Yeah. Why, why don't we start with sort of my, uh, we'll start with Good Harry. Okay. And what Good Harry is, is, uh, and I, I joke, you know, that I'm trying to be less evil in, in, in my new life. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I was only a little evil. I wasn't big evil. And it's, it's, you know, the tech space is rough and tumble. Uh, you know, my, Microsoft, there, there are some not nice people over at Microsoft Redmond. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I've met a few. <laughs> yeah. And um, it's, it's tough. It's, it's, uh, but, you know, I've had a good career in tech and my interests are starting to, to move on. Um, I'll always be a geek and probably have one or two side hustles going on in tech. But what I've been really uh, passionate about uh, since the pandemic um, is two projects that that uh, I, I, I was able to, again, with all due respect, kind of spearhead, 
Um, one was uh, at the recommendation of a, a good friend at Microsoft Canada. Um, she wanted to send my 90-year-old mom a uh, greeting card at her nursing home in Seattle, right? Just, you know, just yeah. send a card. Yeah. And because uh, my mom can't have visitors in the pandemic, right? right? And right. so we collaborated and that grew into a campaign called One Million Smiles. And the idea was, and it's still alive and kicking, the idea was uh, I still have about 50,000 members of SMB Nation. And if each member would send 20 greetings cards to an assisted living center or nursing home, like they could make a little family project, you know, the family around the table filling in cards, little secret, you can go to Dollar General and you can get cards for a buck. You know, at the grocery store, they're like seven bucks, go to Dollar General or Dollar Store, buy some cards. And if we could get the the, the 50,000 people to send 20 cards, uh, we hit um, 1 million smiles. And so uh, Jenny and I and this lady, we put together a spreadsheet of participating assisted living centers. Um, and you typically mail it to the activities director because of privacy. You know, Tim, you're starting to bump into HIPAA and healthcare. So you're like, yep. you can't know the name of my mom. Okay. Right. Uh, so 1 million smiles. We started that in March. And I got to tell you, um, it's been a hoot. I probably, with the holidays, I probably need to emphasize that again. But I had some neighbors come over and we filled out, we had a card party and we felt comfortable in each other's orbit. And it, the, one bottle of wine led to two bottles of wine, which led to three. And, and the cards got sillier, like, you know, uh, 2020 has been a flop. I can't wait till we can dance the bunny hop. <laughs> 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 and, you know, these, these things take on a life of their own. And, and um, but the point is, Tim, I also see that is uh, cause marketing and business development, right? That That's where, while I'm trying to be less evil, I, I also, the, the, projects I've taken on, there's a business purpose and that's okay, right? That, 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 that's okay. Um, yeah. and, and then the other thing is I've been working with the National Christina Foundation to rally the troops, the tribe, the SMB nation. Um, when I cleaned out those mini storages, I found about 12 old laptops and some printers and monitors and we all have that, right? Every computer person has the closet. Yep. And, and there's a handful of dusty old laptops. And um, I went through the process and I've been promoting the National Christina Foundation. And it's a lady who, who comes from our industry, uh, got out of tech and runs it out of Minneapolis. And um, they have a nationwide network of volunteers and refurbishers. So they came to my house in a van, a not-for-profit picked up all this stuff, refurbished it, and got it out to uh, low-income families because of the immediate need for learn from home. So Tim, you know, you've read about this, that all of a sudden you had all these school kids um, learn from home and the low-income and underserved communities can't afford, you know, you, you and I arguably could order a laptop on Amazon. A lot yep. of families can't. So they're getting these, uh, the you know, you, you get the point. They're 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 getting these into the hands of people that need the help, and that's an ongoing thing. And they are quite busy. And so here again, um, it's it's goodness. It's a cause marketing thing. I feel good about myself, but it's also in my wheelhouse, right? To redeploy tech assets. And the deeper and deeper and deeper we got into it, again to reiterate maybe down in your mini storage or shed or garage, you probably have a handful of computers. <laughs> You're in tech. <laughs> Small understatement. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, you know, and again, that needs to be part of the conversation in the pocket MBA. Um, may, may, maybe to check off on the goodness talk. <clears throat> when I got my own MBA at the University of Denver in project management, um, the school was just transitioning to the Daniels School of Business, and Bill Daniels was an early cable pioneer. So you may remember Denver, Colorado had helped start the cable industry, right? Jones and Daniels and some other, you know, way before Comcast and AT&T and that kind of thing. They were still and, and original so, operators back then. Yeah. 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 And uh what the University of Denver did, and I, I was already out the door 
when they rebranded, but they had a course on a required course on ethics. Okay. And it, it was like groundbreaking. And this was coming out of the Michael Milken uh, era and uh, Charles Keating and the SNL scandal. Right. Yep. And, and so ethics were, uh, it, it, it took off in curriculums. Right. And so that's what I, I, I don't want to get too far afield from our conversation about, you know, other things I'm doing. Well, part of it's driven by I'm trying to practice what I preach. <laughs> mm -hmm. Always a good thing. Yep. Yep. And, and maybe to check off on, to better answer your question, what this startup will do. So this is going to become its own entity in 2021. We're in development right now for a system or a kit. And every industry has that, right? The, yep. How to become a realtor in 90 days, sign up for the kit. Um, we're, we're going down that rabbit hole so we can build a community that will have, you know, uh, uh, bonus materials you can download, podcasts, you know, exclusive lectures, that kind of thing. Um, and so I consider this a startup and, and I'm br likely bringing on a partner after the first of the year to assist me. But, you know, I, 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 I guess I just share that with you because we got to reach scale. We got to be relevant. We got to be creative. And, and hopefully there's these uh, over 50s and other uh, personas that, that will pay us money to help them pivot to become an instant entrepreneur because there ain't much left out there for a lot of us, man. <laughs> yeah. And the, the one piece of the market, if my business has taught me anything, and I'm sure you know these folks as well, is it's the folks that have done it for 20 or 25 years that are now in that over 50 and need to be an entrepreneur again, right? Yeah. Yeah, and 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 I tell you, it's even worse. A younger uh, friend of mine. In fact, I remember his first day at Microsoft to to age him, uh, and and I was deep into the SBS era. He finished in Peace Corps in Bolivia, and he said, "Boy, that was a that was a hoot to spend two years in that country." So he starts at Microsoft in the small business server teams. Call it ninety nine. We stayed in touch. He's now at a, uh, I'm going to call it a data warehouse company in the Bay Area, Splunk. Oh, um, I know them. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And he's, you know, he's moved up the ranks. We got together a couple years ago and he was joking that it's even worse here. He's like, I'm, I'm about to reach my mid forties and I'm going to be a dinosaur in the Bay Area. It's even worse. <laughs> 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 So he's already worried. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny. I went to dinner in San Jose uh, probably a year ago or so. And we walked in and there was a 22-year-old kid and a bunch of folks our age. And naturally, the waiter assumed the 22-year-old kid was the CEO, not the CEO. <laughs> <laughs> right? And there were some bruised egos in the room. But it's a great story because everyone looked and said, huh, you know, the dinosaurs are helping the kid. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's uh, the world we live in, but it's it's really true. I've had some uh, friends uh, who, who've been laid off in the pandemic, uh, again, if, our generation, with all due respect, and um, they, they're they they're struggling to get a corporate job. Their report card lines up to be a corporate person, right? Yeah. The, and, and I'm offering words of encouragement and wisdom where I can, but uh, it's ageism is is real in corporate. There's no question about it. It's illegal and it's real. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's an interesting thing. I watched my father fall out of a corporate role at 56. So I've had that yeah. in my head since I was 19 years old, 20 years old. Right? Yeah. Is it's going to happen? So be ready. So I've had that advantage, if you will, my whole life. Yeah. Yeah, hey, I'm I'm getting the high sign. I'm gonna have to hop over uh no problem, to man. uh meet up with an analyst. So, sir, I thank you and let me know how I can help you. You're you you've got a couple side hustles. In fact, we're gonna get you on over on my media network. How's that sound? I, I would love <laughs> that. So let's re let's reconnect, let's get that going. <laughs> okay.